Welcome, everyone. My name is Richard Orme, and I'm delighted to have you join us today for another webinar hosted by the DAISY Consortium. As we count down the days until the European Accessibility Act comes into force, we're bringing you this series of webinars to help you prepare. Today, we explore the topic of accessibility testing. To ensure an accessible user experience, to meet contract requirements and comply with legislation, a range of accessibility tests needs to be applied throughout the ebook journey from the publisher to the reader. In today's webinar, we'll navigate that journey with the help of our invited experts, learning about the accessibility testing that they're conducting, from content creation to discovery and acquisition, all the way through to where the rubber meets a road in reading systems. As our presenters will describe, accessibility testing will give you greater confidence that your products and services are usable by people with print disabilities. And first up, we're looking at content accessibility. To guide us through this part of the process, we're delighted to be joined by Magnus. Hi everyone, my name is Magnus Nyerlund and I'm a development manager at the Society for Swedish Literature in Finland. We produce about 15 titles per year, mainly thick scientific books with images, footnotes and indexes. Almost all of them are made into both EPUBs and PDFs. I started working with eBooks and accessibility last year, so I'm still somewhat new in these circles, but I've been asked to share our experience to aid others in a similar situation. Our work with making accessible eBooks started with my predecessor, so we have been at it for a few years already. The whole publishing department is aware of what they can do, starting with using the proper formatting in Word manuscripts before they reach InDesign. Using the accessibility checker in Word can help highlight any issues, including with the structure or image accessibility. Writing alt texts has also become a central part of the editor's work instead of just an afterthought. It's often repeated, but it's important that all those in the workflow are aware of what they can do for accessibility. It makes the later testing and remediation a lot easier. A few smaller publications I make into ePubs on my own, but it's a lot of manual work, so we do send most of our InDesign files to an external producer who does the bulk of the conversion. He also tests the files with at least the basic checkers like ePub Check and Ace by Daisy before they reach us. ePub Check lets you know if the ePub structure is valid and follows ePub specifications while Ace by Daisy tests the publication against the EPUB accessibility specification, identifying any issues that can be automatically checked and linking to useful resources to help resolve those issues. This often means links to Daisy Knowledge Base, which is a great repository of best practices and samples covering all aspects of EPUB publications. Ace by Daisy can only perform automated checks after which manual testing is required. The reports generated by ACE can be loaded into SMART, which then guides you through the manual testing process. I've also built up a checklist that's specific to our publications that I go through. A big part of it comes from the feedback we received from Benetech. In 2023, we qualified for the Global Certified Accessible Certificate. It's renewed yearly by submitting an EPUB for evaluation. They then basically list what you are required to remediate, what they recommend you to correct, and also suggested best practices. I like to open the EPUB in a text or code editor like Oxygen XML and work my way through the separate files, manually editing in missing metadata and correcting the code, ARIA labels, and so on. A good editor can also alert you if the code isn't well formed. After everything looks good, I run at least Ace by Daisy just to make sure everything is still in order. Passing the basic checkers is a good start, but the ebook or EPUB might still have a lot of accessibility issues or at least things you can improve on, so some form of, man of manual testing is still needed. I highly recommend doing some manual scrolling and testing in different e-readers like Calibre, Thorium or Calibrio. 
preferably also on a few different devices and screens to make sure there are no big issues with scaling or footnotes or anything like that. It is also important to test how the text to speech plays out, either those with built into the e-readers or with screen readers like NVDA. This can reveal problems in the structure or coding which you can then fix. Using assistive technology like screen readers is a good first step, but it's also a good idea to have an expert to have expert users provide feedback. This is an area where we're keen to develop and one which we would take our testing to the next level. In short, start small and take one step at a time. Testing is very important and there are great free tools that can do the basic testing. After you've reached a certain point, I'd recommend you have an external expert take a look at your files and provide easy to follow feedback so you can improve your workflow and the accessibility of your eBooks. That's all from me. Thank you, Magnus. You've done a great job conveying lots of information in the limited time we gave you. I'm sure people will have lots of questions. So a reminder that you can use the Q&A button in Zoom to submit the questions and we'll cover as many as possible towards the end of the webinar. Well, after you've created your accessible publication, we'll need to examine where people discover and acquire a title. So to help us look at web accessibility, we're delighted to be joined by Ted from Elsevier. Hi everyone, my name is Ted Geese. Accessibility Manager at Elsevier. Today I'm going to be providing a brief overview of techniques and tools used to test web pages for accessibility, which should be part of your strategy for meeting the European Accessibility Act and other regulations. Our approach to accessibility at Elsevier is underpinned by three guiding principles. We collaborate and educate around accessibility, we utilize industry standard tools, and we embed accessibility in our business operations. Actively practicing these three key principles requires conducting frequent accessibility testing throughout the product development lifecycle. To learn more about our approach, visit our Elsevier Accessibility Statement and just launched European Accessibility Act Statement. Links to all the resources mentioned today will be placed on the webinar summary page. Why does accessibility testing matter? The EAA requires that eBooks need to be accessible in a way that is perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. These are the same four principles which comprise the W3C's Web Content Accessibility Guidelines, which are very well accepted as the international de facto accessibility standards for digital content, especially websites. While eBooks are often thought of in common file formats such as PDF, Moby Kindle, EPUB, VST, eBooks are also commonly provided as HTML web pages on a publisher website. At Elsevier, we provide several websites where users can access eBooks in HTML. This includes ScienceDirect, one of our key Elsevier platforms with over 46,000 scientific, technical, and health books. In 2023, ScienceDirect achieved the number one most accessible homepage out of the top million homepages as part of the Web A Million study. So how do you test your websites for accessibility? Which methods and tools do you need to be compliant, accessible, what about going beyond compliance? The good news is that when it comes to web page accessibility testing, there are an unlimited number of tools, many of which are free and many of which require zero installation of apps on your computer. The bad news is that there are an unlimited number of tools. So which ones should you use? How often and in what order? Today, I'm here to only provide an overview of the types of accessibility testing tools and methods, especially aimed at people who are new to this topic. So here are six categories of testing methods, which I will briefly discuss. Note that while I call out some tools by name, this is not meant to be a comprehensive list. 
and I'm not sh I'm not here to advocate for one tool or another. Let's start with automated scanner tools. These tools are typically free browser plugins, which can be used to test single or multiple web pages. Tools such as Wave, X, Andy, Microsoft Accessibility Insights, and Bookmarklets can be activated in one or two clicks. Automated scanners will use a rule set to judge the accessibility features present, missing, or well, messed up in the source code. They are great for sniffing out common problems, such as missing alt text on images, poorly or unlabeled form controls, and poor text color contrast. One drawback to using automated scanners is that they will only find 20 to 30% of the total possible accessibility issues. Well, that's why we have so many different categories to complement the automated tools. And additionally, there are false positives with some scanners. And thankfully, tools are overall getting better at avoiding false positives. Manual testing typically requires no installation of any apps. Start with making sure your website's interactive controls like buttons, links, and menus are fully operable with keyboard alone. Make sure when you tab through your interface that every interactive element shows a visible focus indicator like a rectangular border. Other tests you can perform manually include zooming in on your web page. In Windows, it's as easy as Control Plus or in Mac, Command Plus. When zoomed in to 200%, is the site still usable without any content or functionality loss? If so, you are well on your way to meeting the relevant accessibility standards. As you gain more technical knowledge, some manual code inspection will really help clue you in to whether or not accessibility techniques have been followed. Code inspection is a precision tool which requires good knowledge or advanced knowledge of accessible markup techniques. An example task would be to look for your IMG, your image elements, and determine whether or not they have appropriate attributes, such as alt or aria label, which describe the image. User testing is what I would call the source of truth of accessibility. We have all the standards, techniques, and automated tools to help design and develop accessible web pages. But in the wild, can a person with a disability actually use your web pages with their assistive technology? And moreover, can they accomplish the key tasks without difficulty? No automated tool will tell you that. And keep in mind, you can have a website that passes all of the WCAG guidelines, gets a clean automated scan, but if it has a poorly designed user interface, uh, user experience, then it's a fail. Imagine if you had to only use a website with a keyboard and you had to tab through 300 links or more before finding the one you really want to go to. So assistive technology testing, I highly recommend what we call AT testing to test websites because it simulates how a person with a disability will experience your ebook or other content. We want to make sure our designs work when experienced through the different lenses of assistive technology. Therefore, we use screen readers such as JAWS, NVDA VoiceOver. Uh, we use speech input such as Dragon, screen magnification such as Zoom Text, and high contrast and color settings, which you can adjust using your operating system settings. Uh, going towards a more formal approach, you may want to adopt a guided based test. Uh, there's the USDHS Trusted Tester Methodology and DQ's WCAG Conformance Testing Methodology. If you are new to accessibility testing, I wouldn't start with these guides, though, and I would suggest to first gain some confidence and experience using simpler, more bite-sized testing tools. Finally, there is what I would call advanced tooling. This includes many paid enterprise software, which will not only detect accessibility issues like the free automated tools, but the advanced tooling like AMP, Events, UserWay, PopeTech, and many others will help you identify, fix, manage, and track accessibility issues as you go on the journey. For developers, using an accessibility linter will highlight some key issues in front end code, right in the IDE for your convenience, 
And for devs and QAs, you can employ tools like Axe with Cypress to integrate accessibility testing into your automated test bench. A final note, all of these tools will help improve the overall usability and accessibility of your websites. And this includes book chapters in HTML. However, it's really including the voice of the user, including people with disabilities in your journey, which will open up paradigm shifting innovations for your users. As an example of a recent user centered innovation is Google Pixel's guided frame feature for helping people who are visually impaired take better photos. So this was just a whistle stop overview of the topic of web accessibility testing. If people have specific questions, I'd be happy to answer them in the Q&A here in a little while. Also, you can contact Elsevier's accessibility team by emailing us at accessibility at elsevier.com. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you, Ted, for doing a wonderful job summarizing the broad topic of web accessibility so concisely. And as Ted mentioned, we'll be collecting links for all the resources that we've mentioned, and we'll be publishing them on the webinar summary pages in a few days. Next up, we're joined by Prashant, a member of the DAISY team. Prashant will be talking about the next stage of accessibility testing, considering the final stage of content consumption as he looks at reading system accessibility testing. Over to you, Prashant. Hello, I'm Prashant Ranjan Verma, Accessibility Specialist for DAISY Consortium. I will be talking about accessibility testing of reading systems. Reading systems can be made accessible for all users by ensuring that the reading app interface is accessible and that the reading app supports EPUB accessibility features. The reading system UI, which could be a native app for one of the operating systems like Windows or Android or iOS or similar, or which could be a web app that works within the browser. That UI is accessible when it works with different input methods like keyboard, mouse, and touch. And when the UI supports common assistive technology like screen readers, magnifiers, and braille displays. The accessible UI should also support color contrast and text resizing requirement. As an example, a person with visual impairment may want to use the computer with keyboard and screen reader. In such a case, if some of the features of the UI cannot be accessed without the keyboard, if they work only with the mouse, then that part of the UI will be inaccessible. Reading system should support basic reading and navigation features for all users. It should support navigation from the table of contents to different chapters and subsections. The app should support print page navigation. It should support image alt text or image descriptions. It should also support visual adjustments. Many users with disabilities want to change the visual presentation according to their liking. They want to change the text size, the text color, the background color, the margins, or the spacing between words and so on. So to be accessible, the reading system should support these features. The reading system should also have a built-in read aloud facility to have the text read in text-to-speech voice. For an accessible reading experience, both the content, that is the EPUB file, and the reading system need to conform to standards and best practices. Tools are available to test the validity and accessibility of content, and this has been discussed in a separate presentation. The reading system accessibility can be ensured by supporting accessibility tests, which are based on user requirements and best practices. EPUBtest.org epubtest.org has tests for evaluating reading system support for accessibility requirements. The evaluations are conducted by accessibility experts and users of assistive technology from all over the world. 
tests are conducted with different assistive technology, OS, browser and device combinations. For example, the apps are tested with NVDA screen reader on the Windows OS. And if the app is a web app, then inside Google Chrome browser. The apps are also tested with uh, other screen readers, for example, voiceover on iOS and with uh, refreshable braille devices. Test results help developers to improve their products. Test results help institutional purchasers to select most accessible solutions. The tests are contained in EPUB files on the epubtest.org website. These EPUB files are specially designed for testing the various accessibility features. There are four EPUB files for testing the fundamental accessibility of reading systems, such as support for basic functionality, support for non-visual reading, support for visual adjustments, and the read aloud feature. It also has test files for evaluating support for media overlays, extended descriptions, and mathematics. The tests are marked as pass or fail by the testers. Each reading system accordingly gets a score in each category. Testers provide notes with each test to help users and app developers. As an example, we can see that the Easy Reader app for Windows has very good, very high scores in different categories. An easy to read summary of the detailed accessibility evaluations has been published as an article on the inclusive publishing website. The article is called Reading System Accessibility Support Roundup. The pros and cons of uh, popular EPUB reading app have been uh, mentioned in this article, which is updated regularly. Thanks for watching. Thank you, Prashant. You've helped clarify the work taking place on reading system testing. At DAISY, we regularly hear from developers and consumers about how valuable this testing is. Now, as part of this countdown to the European Accessibility Act series, we've been hearing from people across the EU about the impact of the legislation, some of the challenges in implementation and the recommendations for action. This time, we hear from Alejandro from Belgium and Elisa from Lithuania. My name is Alejandro Moledo, and I'm the Deputy Director and Head of Policy at the European Disability Forum, the organization representing persons with disabilities at European level. We are based in Brussels, Belgium, but I'm originally from Spain. Hi, I'm Elisa Zharkova, the Head of Publishing Department at the Lithuanian Odessa Century Library. We offer services for individuals with print disabilities, produces information resources in accessible formats, manages the digital library Elvis and functions as a center of expertise. The European Disability Movement uh, campaigned for many years to get the European Accessibility Act a reality for all persons with disabilities, and we campaigned to get an ambitious law that could have an impact on the everyday lives of persons with disabilities. One of the key aspects of the act is to ensure that accessibility will be considered from the outset, so from the beginning. And within the publishing industry, we really hope that this will boost uh, inclusive reading, inclusive education, and more accessible materials that are accessible to all persons with disabilities. A unified agreement on quality standards for accessible publications is needed to ensure consistency across European Union countries. We hope the EAA will enhance access to publications for individuals with disabilities by increasing the availability of accessible publications, establishing uniform guidelines, funding projects to expand accessibility books, and encouraging a collaboration between publishers, libraries, and technological companies. Providing training for publishers, ensuring a strong legal framework for promoting inclusive publishing, and improving access to educational resources for students with disabilities are also crucial. These measures will empower individuals with disabilities and foster a more inclusive society. We believe that the 
the focus of public authorities and companies is to start working on accessibility right now. Accessibility cannot be achieved overnight, and we believe that to do so, they need, first of all, to invest in accessibility expertise, the infrastructure, the tools that they need to in order to uh, produce accessible products and services, and equally important, to reach out to the disability community to understand what are the barriers, what are the best solutions to really fulfill the legal requirements of the legislation, and as well, to employ persons with disabilities because having a diverse workforce will ensure that actually accessibility is considered throughout the value chain and the internal processes of any company or any organization. Our key priorities include continuing to certify books published by Lithuanian publishers and increasing the number of born accessible publications. This year we have trained 150 participants from over 30 publishing houses, as well as more than 10 advertising design firms, libraries and museums involved in publishing. We are grateful for our high level of engagement and motivation shown by the participants, some of whom dedicated the entire work week up to 44 hours for this inclusive publishing trainings. We feel a strong interest in inclusive publishing and are confident that, thanks to everyone for us, we will make able to open up literature to a much larger audience. We plan to continue providing ongoing consultations to publishers and undertaking pilot projects with publisher houses to help them understand the nuances of the EPUB format. Furthermore, we will make efforts to promote the pub 3 format to both those with print disabilities and all readers by educating them on how to read a pub 3 Well, thank you to Alejandro and Elisa for those perspectives. Well, our presenters have covered a lot of ground. Magnus told us about the accessibility testing of the publications coming from, from SLS. SLS. Ted gave us an overview of techniques and tools used to test web pages, and Prashant described the testing protocol used to evaluate accessibility support and features in reading systems. We've a bunch of questions already queued up, but if you have questions for any or all of our speakers, then you can use the Q&A button in Zoom to submit them, and we'll cover as many as possible uh, in the remaining time. Uh, so first of all, I've actually got a question that will come to each of you in turn. Uh, so the question is, uh, can you give some examples of issues that your accessibility testing has thrown up? Maybe some typical things that you've trapped through the accessibility testing. Turning to you first, Magnus. Uh, I feel like I've gotten the hang of most EPUB issues, but I still have some way to go when it comes to PDF remediation. So the tagging and, and structure there is, is often something I need to look into. Great, thank you. And to you, Ted, what do you usually discover? Yeah, that's a great question, Richard. A uh, few of the, the, the key things that pop up a lot when we're testing web pages, um, images that are missing descriptions, whether it's alt or, or some other technique used to label the image, is missing um, form controls, uh, with, which are unlabeled or labeled incorrectly, um, links which are empty or missing an accessible name, uh, happens a lot with icons and, and, and other kind of graphical links, and then uh, text color contrast pops up quite a bit. So, you know, the W3C's WCAG requirements uh, require us all to, to make sure our, our text is uh, four and a half to one contrast ratio against background. So pops up a lot. Yeah, those are four. Yeah, good examples. And I think I would say they're not technical faults. Those all have a high impact on the end user experience, don't they? So uh, thank you for those. And Prashant, so what are the kind of uh, typical issues that you discover when testing the uh, ebook reading apps? Yeah, so we test uh, the reading systems for uh, an accessible EPUB reading experience. 
and uh, we mostly test uh, uh, with an assistive technology. We want to make sure that all functionality is available to users, uh, all users, including those who use some assistive technology like a screen reader or a magnifier. So some of the common issues that we find are uh, uh, like sometimes the navigation from the table of content to a chapter or subsection is, is broken or is not uh, does not work uh, um, as desired with the assistive technology. Um, at times, the the note taking feature, the annotation feature also uh, not does not always work uh, with some of those uh, technologies. And uh, similarly, um, we have also found issues in support for mathematics, uh, support for reading of footnotes, or uh, or like uh, a feature that uh, persons with disabilities often want is uh, the where am I feature. That is, they want to be aware as to where they are in the book, which chapter, which page they are reading. And uh, they want this information and then they want to continue reading. So uh, not all uh, um, EPUB reading apps are uh, supporting this. People often lose their reading, reading position when they try to get this kind of information. Right. And again, these are these are examples you've given that have a high impact on the end user experience. Just to clarify, when you were saying that the table of contents navigation is not supported, is that a problem with the EPUB itself or with the app? Is that with a well-produced EPUB? That you find this problem. So, uh, yes. So, so we we test with a uh, with a with a uh, proper proper EPUB like the, the EPUB which has been designed properly. It's accessible. It has a uh, uh, working TOC. So, if that EPUB doesn't work in one of the the uh, EPUB reading apps, then then we can we are able to easily conclude that the the, the problem is it is in the app and not in the EPUB. So. So the with the EPUB validity, uh, uh, we are ensuring, uh, and and therefore, uh, uh, so we are sure that uh, that the uh, problem is in the functionality, and in, in particular, uh, the the functionality may be working uh, without any assistive technology. Uh, it may be working in a particular combination, but uh, when we test with different uh, combinations of uh, assistive technology. Uh, uh, on different platforms, then then it sometimes doesn't work on some of them. I understand. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, coming back to you, Magnus, uh, you mentioned that you're relatively new to this world of accessibility, and with so many people preparing for the European Accessibility Act and other accessibility legislation, I imagine many are in your position, maybe quite a few watching this webinar. So do you have any advice for those people on how to get started with the accessibility testing? Where did you turn to? Well, I inherited a decent process, so I, I familiarized you. myself with that. And it was a lot of learning by doing, but it didn't, meant I didn't start from scratch. So a lot of it depends on what programs and formats you use, of course. And... Uh, there are a lot of learning materials and uh, webinars and so on out there. So you could start with that. Um, doing one thing at a time, like starting with alt texts or or things like that and looking at other people's EPUBs and how they resolve the issue and so on. Right. Well, one thing at a time. Here's the next one thing coming in your direction. This is a question from, uh, it was posted anonymously. Uh, do you have any tips for ensuring your figures and graphs are accessible? What are the kind of challenges you might have there? Or where would you point someone to for the answers to that? Yeah, we haven't had a lot of graphs since I started, at least complex ones, but uh, testing them manually to see if you can navigate them and seeing how screen readers cope with them. Text-to-speech usually reveals a lot. And real user feedback would, of course, be better, but it's not always possible. Yeah, great. And uh, Magnus, you hinted that you had a custom list of accessibility checks that you use. Could you give us some examples of the kind of things that are on it? And how is it different from the other accessibility testing that you're already doing? Sure. Uh, nothing exciting, really, but it's mostly an ordered list specific to our publication process uh, steps that are easily taken and fixed in InDesign before the conversion and 
like making sure the bookmarks and content list is correct and headings, links, and so on. And then there's a list of things I, I fix after we get the EPUB. Again, mostly relating to, to the state of the EPUB we get, like fixing page numbers and ARIA labels and some search and replace in code and something like that. I, I made the list partly in case someone else would need to step in at some time. So there would be a step by step for them to follow. Very thoughtful of you, Magnus. Okay, so Ted, we're turning to you next. Uh, and firstly, congratulations for your award-winning work on accessibility. It's clear that Elsevier are really focused on delivering an accessible user experience. We have a variety of people attending these webinars, and it might be that the smaller publishers are thinking that accessibility testing is fine for an organization with a team of people dedicated to it. But do you have advice for smaller publishers or those with smaller teams? Yeah, yeah, I, I can relate to this in in, in that uh, our our program started with, uh, dare I say, a halftime person, a halftime accessibility specialist, and, and we've really grown since then. Um, so for the smaller publishers, you know, I, I would advocate for providing a wide variety of formats. Um, and, and this maybe goes beyond kind of the, the question, but if if smaller publishers haven't started offering EPUB or HTML formats, um, that is that is a crucial thing because um, some of the some of the more rigid formats like PDFs do not reflow very well, <laughs> if at all, and and uh, there there is value in in and you really want to make sure that um, readers have uh, the ability to to open their book in in the device and and app they want. So that's a that's a good thing. Uh, but yeah, I, I would say don't underestimate how important your front end code, your HTML behind what you can visually see. Don't underestimate how important that is to ensure an accessible experience. So, um, front end engineers who are using modern technologies are going to, are going to have a lot easier job in terms of making the overall web experience or, or mo mobile app experience more accessible. Um, a lot of a lot of these things that we're talking about, a lot of these features mentioned, um, visually they're not apparent. And you really have to use proper style sheets, device independent um, JavaScript um, coding, and you know, just just a, a, a basic thing, just making sure everyone can use your app, uh, your your website in a in a way that's uh, device independent. You don't have to rely on a mouse. You know, not 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 all users, especially assistive technology users, control their computer screens with mouse. So, you know, device independence is key. So there's just you know there's some basic principles I think for the smaller publishers to recognize um, to help them on their journey. Um, and this next question to you, Ted, may be in the same vein, but I don't think exclusively smaller publishers. Uh, so you mentioned that many Elsevier websites display the content of publications, uh, but what about websites that maybe don't have that feature? They're more about the catalog and yeah. um, discovery and so on. Do publishers need to make those accessible too, or do they only need to pay attention to those that are displaying the content to the end user? Oh, that's an excellent question. Yeah, I mean... Without without trying to recite any of the guidance from the European Accessibility Act, there 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 are supporting um, materials that are important for users to fully understand how accessible your eBooks or other products, e-commerce, for instance, it are. So a lot of times, the corp the main corporate website, um, the marketing supporting pages will provide uh, some of those details about. Okay, does this ebook format support screen readers? Can text be enlarged, et cetera? Um, so I think those supporting materials are crucial to make accessible in addition to the main content site. Um, and then you get into you know your support center, how, how to contact customer support about that product. Those sites are very important to make accessible as well. Right. Thank you. Um I've got more questions for uh, both Magnus and Ted, but uh, spreading them around a little bit. Prashant, some questions coming your way. Uh, one from Casey. Uh, 
Is there a good ebook reader that you can use on your computer to verify the accessibility features of the EPUBs that you're producing? Uh, okay, so so we have been testing uh, different uh, ebook readers, and we have been publishing the results on EPUB test, and uh, and based on that their results, uh, we can of course say that uh, uh, that uh, some of them are. are very good uh, and they are giving a very good uh, ex experience uh, so if i have to name uh, one some of them then uh, then on the windows platform for example thorium reader um, uh, i think it, it is a very good uh, epub reading app uh, it's very much accessible with uh, different assistive technologies as well like uh, screen readers and it has very good uh, uh, visual adjustment features also so so people can can uh, change uh, the colors that the, have, it has different themes uh, it allows um, users to kind of even change the font and the margins uh, so so thorium is definitely uh, one of one of the uh, re readers uh, and then i also mentioned in my presentation easy reader and it's available for uh, the all 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 operating systems like uh, android and ios as well so it is also one of the very popular uh, epub reading apps great thank you prashant yeah. i'm going to come back to you but magnus i think you mentioned in your talk that you test the ebooks that you're producing in reading systems uh, did you have any suggestions for casey that uh, maybe prashant did mention yet um, I like to use Calibre or Thorium as well. So at least those two usually go Thank goes you. a long way. Nice. Um, okay, so Prashant, back to you. Uh, wow, there are so many different reading systems out there. How do you select the ones that you actually do the testing on? So yes, yeah, so uh, one is like... Uh... JZ Consortium is a membership-based organization, and so we sometimes get a request uh, from our members or from various user groups. And uh, at the same time, we are also on the lookout. We also try to assess uh, which EPUB reading app is uh, kind of uh, used widely uh, in the uh, among persons with disabilities. And sometimes the the company, the developers themselves, also uh, join our. Uh, uh, EPUB test uh, pro uh, group, and they often request us to test uh, their apps. So, so, uh, so, uh, and actually, when we come to know of any 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 EPUB reading app uh, on our own, uh, we just try to uh, test it quickly. If it is promising, if it has some accessibility support, then we try to kind of uh, um, list it in our priority, and then we uh, continue to test it. Yeah. Uh, super. Um, yeah. mm. If the developer of a reading system is watching and would like their app to be tested, how, how should they start? And can developers actually do, well, in fact, anyone, can they do their own testing using the EPUB test protocols? Yes. Yeah, so so I, I would suggest that uh, developers visit EPUB test and the results page. Maybe someone has already tested their app. And in that case, they can check the results um, uh, and and their comments. Uh, based on that, maybe they can maybe some make some improvements, or if they have questions uh, on the testing on the on the results, they can they can contact us uh, through the through EPUB test. If their uh, app is not already tested, they can uh, themselves uh, choose to test it. So EPUB test has uh, a test suite. Um, the, all the test books are there. Uh, it's like uh, free to download, so they can uh, download those 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 test books. They can open it in their app, and uh, those test books contain all the all the tests and the instructions to perform those tests. So so they can they can based on that they can maybe uh, make some improvements changes uh, in their uh, apps. Um, they can also request us uh, for an account on EPUB test um, and, and uh, upload their testing results, or they could also request us to kind of do the testing and, and we could also um, upload results for them. So um, if, if the app is in under development, uh, uh, we could actually kind of test and, and uh, before publishing also, we can let them know uh, how how it's performing, and so that uh, 
by the time the app is finalized, uh, they can they can ensure more accessibility. Thank you, Prashant. I've got one more question from you before we come back to Magnus. I know that publishers are always interested to know that the work they put into making accessible ebooks uh, are going to work well in the apps that people are then going to use. Having conducted many years of testing ebook apps uh, and devices, do you have a sense of whether or not the apps are getting better? with their accessibility features and support? Or, or putting it another way, are the apps going to be ready for all this accessible content that's coming their way? Yeah, the accessibility uh, in, in the apps has been improving consistently. I think when we started, uh, many apps uh, even did not support the reading of the image all text. So, but this, but that is, I think, almost uh, taken for granted. Uh, almost all apps uh, um, um, are supporting image all text uh, reading with some read aloud feature or maybe a screen reader. Similarly, um, some in many apps the 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 text part was not accessible with the screen reader. With using a screen reader, one could not uh, uh, navigate within the text. Uh, so those things have been mostly taken care of. Uh, navigation by headings, navigation. Uh, from the table of contents to a, a part of the uh, book. So uh, many, many features are, are, are like uh, being supported uh, fairly well, very widely. Uh, uh, one, one pleasant development is support for uh, mathematics, uh, MathML. So uh, there is support in many apps for that now. And so much so that uh, we have this test used to be in our advanced book. Uh, it used to be kind of, and you can say, uh, an optional test. Uh, so, so we have moved it to our uh, fundamental uh, test book. So, be because we had noticed a lot of support for this, and uh, similarly, like uh, support for uh, internal hyperlinks, uh, reading of footnotes. So, uh, so, so there is, there is, of course, uh, I will say that uh, most apps have become more accessible. Um, still, uh, some of the apps need to catch up, but but yeah, overall the trend is trend is very satisfy satisfactory. I will say. Very good. That's reassuring to know, Prashant. Okay, so coming back to you, Magnus. Um, the first question is from Jim, and his question is: uh, Benetech Global Certification is only available for publishers. Do you know of anything comparable available for individuals? I, I guess that's uh, self-publishing authors or uh, those that publish that way is my interpretation of the question. Do you know of anything along those lines, so certification for individuals? I know there are at least for professionals, but I don't remember the name of the certificates, but they might be expensive as well, but there's something I, I can't give any answer. No. Okay. Maybe that's something that we can uh, include on the webinar summary page. Um, the next one, one of the topics that's most often raised in these webinars, Magnus, as you probably know, is on image descriptions. Uh, as part of your accessibility testing, how do you test that the image descriptions that have been, that are there have been applied correctly and work well in practice? So not simply that they're present, that they're kind of appropriate and working for the end user? Well, again, it's it's manual scrolling and screen readers and and do you mean the alt texts as well or? Yeah, yeah. 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 In, in our editors write them and they check with, in the context and with the image description that everything works together. And then I insert them, and at that point I also take a look at it. So we have a sort of double check there, and then it's the manual checker or text to speech. Thank you, Magnus. Uh, this next question I think is to Magnus uh, and or Ted. Uh, it's from Sarah. Do you know of any specific training on checking for accessibility? Something that shows things step by step. Uh, Sarah says that she has been trying to do it all based on various instructions that she finds online, but it would be much easier if she could kind of see how to do things following through these things. So training on accessibility testing. Magnus, anything from you? Um, nothing consistent. I've 
picked up one thing here and one thing there. So so I don't have any any good series or anything, no. Okay, so uh, Ted, well, the world of web accessibility surely is much more mature and established. Uh, what's your suggestions for Sarah in terms of accessibility testing training? Yeah, well, hey, I, I could say I, I don't have the perfect solution. I, I know of a couple of couple of ideas there. If someone is really like going towards like a formal sense and, and they really kind of want to follow a step-by-step -step procedure, the the guided testing I had mentioned earlier in the uh, webinar was, is the U.S. Uh, Department of Homeland Security Trusted Tester Methodology. And you can you can even get to that methodology for free. It's not behind a paywall or anything and kind of see if that resonates. And if if so, you could even sign up for the DHS's uh, Trusted Tester Program, which kind of takes you through um, almost like a course uh, but it is a time commitment, and, and it is it is the more formal route, uh, not not for complete beginners, in my in my opinion. Um, I haven't seen any great video products or or things out there that just show step by step how to test. They may be out there, but I'm unaware of them. Um, and I know um, I know like you know just just in terms of WCAG conformance testing, if if you want to read it. And and kind of digest it that way. Um, DQ offers a uh, uh, some some really good uh, uh, training in that respect for how to test things right. for WCAG conformance. Thank you, Ted. And that's the company D E Q U E. Yeah, DQ. Yeah. Um, I think I got that right. Thank you. And it's a related question, maybe to any of our um, presenters today. Um, uh, Jim says uh, that he's looking for a place where he can get feedback on the uh, ebooks that he's producing in terms of their accessibility. So, uh, thoughts from any of you on so you make your ebook, you look to follow the standards, you do the testing yourself. What about some kind of third party reassurance, some feedback on that? Uh, thoughts from any of you on this? Help Jim out. Uh, well, I can say that like, um, so they, they should be using ACE for sure uh, to, to check accessibility of the EPUB they are creating. And uh, and so, so on our uh, information and help section, uh, we have some guidance on how to use uh, ACE. And um, if they have questions, they can definitely contact us, the DAISY Consortium, through our website if they have any technical questions. Great. So technical support. I think Jim is kind of reaching for someone else taking a look at the EPUB and kind of maybe spotting things that he hadn't spotted and stuff. Uh, Magnus, any wise words on this one? I think you mentioned um, that you do have some experts feeding in. Yeah. In some countries, there are accessibility departments or offices or something that usually can take a look at it. In Finland, we have Celia for example, and that would perhaps be the first first stop. Great. Thank you. And on this kind of uh, guided process, uh, not a question, but Lee very helpfully has said that Accessibility Insights offers a free browser extension that includes a fully guided overview process. I don't know if that's uh, helpful. I'm not actually familiar with that one. Uh, we're running a bit tight on time. I'm trying to include as many questions as we've got. There is one here that may be shaped more for you, Ted, because it probably relates to some of the journal content. Uh, it's from Kerry, I th think. Yeah. Uh, can you speak about how magazines and journals can be made accessible? The magazine publishers that Kerry works with publish in PDF. Um, um, due to the image heavy nature of their publications and their desire to maintain the formatting. So this is kind of fixed layout type stuff. We'll have to be brief with this. I've got a couple more questions I'd love to squeeze in. Any quick thoughts on that, the kind of complex yeah. Yeah, yeah. designed yeah. content? Yeah, yeah. F fixed layout is tricky because you, you're you're basically saying that um, you, you don't want your content to reflow, your text to reflow nicely in the in the container that you're viewing it in in your in your screen or your browser, so um, there. But that's not the only consideration for accessibility, of course. So those 
those magazines, those image heavy uh, publications, I would want to know how they're created. If they're created in InDesign, there are some things that you can do early on in, in the InDesign uh, phase, if you will, to, to make sure that the, the text equivalents are there for the image, to make sure that your uh, semantic structure is in place, your heading structure, et cetera. And if, if you get those in place in the beginning in InDesign, it's usually just a couple of clicks to um, to result in a in an accessible tag PDF. So if you're if you're not right. doing that, look into that. Okay, Ted, thank you for that quick tip on what could be a whole webinar in itself. I'm going to squeeze one more in. I'm going to get told off for this, but there are two questions: one from Anna and one from Bill that relate to vendors. So how can you? Uh, any thoughts on testing the reliability of the content that's coming from vendors? Anything different? Uh, from what has been discussed. Magnus, I think you said that you use vendors uh, for a lot of your content uh, already. Any any um, advice for Anna and Bill uh, who are asking about the role of vendors and suppliers on this? Do you get them to do testing themselves? Do you coach them on that? Uh, we, we use one, yes. And, and he's, he's very knowledgeable already. So you have to build up your own knowledge so you can check it check it for yourself yeah. okay that, so it. knowledge in the place of the vendor but also make sure you have the knowledge uh in-house it takes two to tango thank you so much we're coming right to the end of our time today thank you again to magnus ted prashant alejandro and Elisa for your excellent contributions to this webinar and to remind you that in the treasure trove that is the daisy webinar archive you'll find more than 30 hours of video, articles, and links to resources related to accessible publishing. This webinar is the third event in our countdown series, a 12 month program exploring all aspects of accessible publishing and reading, facilitating knowledge sharing and helping everyone involved to understand and prepare for the European Accessibility Act. I'm happy to share the next three scheduled topics with you now. On September the 25th, with 269 days to go until the EAA comes into force, it's the term for image descriptions. This webinar will discuss the practical workflow approaches taken by a number of publishers to ensure that high quality image descriptions are efficiently authored for both front and backlist titles. On October the 23rd, with 241 days to go, the webinar will focus on reading solutions. Ensuring that people can read accessible ebooks across a variety of different platforms, customizing the presentation of that next of that content, and supplying and supporting the use of a diverse range of assistive technology is far from a simple task. So in this webinar, we'll hear from uh, leading reading systems developers, including representatives from Amazon and Kobo, to learn about the innovations that they're making to support accessible reading and their ongoing work to improve the reading experience for everyone. And on November the 27th, uh, join us for Accessibility in Practice. This webinar is designed to coincide with the European Day for People with Disabilities, and we'll share messages from people across Europe. We'll learn how people read with assistive technology, We'll hear how what a uh, difference the often small considerations in ebook creation can make to them and the impact that is already being experienced uh, by recent accessibility innovations in digital publishing. We'll be answering the questions what does accessibility mean in practice? How do people with print disabilities read ebooks with assistive technology? And how would the European Accessibility Act impact on the lives of individuals? Find out more at daisy.org forward slash webinars, where you can also sign up to the webinar announcement mailing list to learn about new topics as we add them. If you'd like to suggest a subject, or if you'd like to share your perspective on the forthcoming European Accessibility Act, then please email us at webinars at daisy.org. Thank you for coming today. I'll hope you'll join us again next time. Goodbye.